Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your name when prompted. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I would like to turn the call over to Mr. Leland Milstein. Sir, you may begin. Great. Thanks very much, and thanks to everyone for joining us today for the ACT webcast series. The Thursday webcast series is a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience two model organizations' methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. This session is approved for, by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE. If you haven't already given me your certification number, please email it to me after this session so you can get the credit you deserve. Most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which we can provide to anyone who needs one as well. So again, email me after the session. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees. If you're not a member, please consider joining us. I want to say a big thank you to our sponsors today, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Species Selection Part 2, Seasonal Landscaping. Trees in the landscape might be most famous for their fall foliage, but thoughtful planting can produce multiple seasons of interest. In addition to leaf color, other features like bark, limbs, fruit, flowers, scent, and overall form contribute to the visual appeal of trees. Many features become noticeable only in winter, after leaves have fallen and exposed uh, the bark and branch structure underneath. Some trees retain their fruit through the winter, some flower in the summer, and many blossom in the spring. Carefully selecting the trees for your landscape with an eye to seasonal characteristics can help ensure that the trees will attract people's attention and appreciation exactly when they're supposed to. Here to tell us a little more about that today is our first speaker, Greg Page, who's the Arboretum Curator at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratory in Charlotte, North Carolina. Greg joined the Bartlett ranks as Arboretum Curator in May of 2005. Greg's career in public horticulture has spanned 20 years. Previous to Bartlett, he was at Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Belmont, North Carolina, and the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. Additionally, he has worked at the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, the Holden Arboretum outside Cleveland, Ohio, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Gardens, as well as tours of duty in the landscape maintenance world, the nursery trade, and even a stint as a horticulturist at a cemetery. Greg, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Take it away. All right. Um, a pretty broad topic to try to cover in a, in a short span of time, as, as most of these webinar topics will be, but I think it's a good one. And um, flashed up on your shiny screen right now is just a little bit of information about uh, where I am at. Uh, at the bottom is our, our website. If you want some more information about the research lab or, or Bartlett as a company, um, that's a, a good link to all of the above. Um, and without further ado, let's, let's go ahead and, and get started and jump right into it. The topic, as Leland mentioned, was uh, seasonal landscaping, and what I want to talk about is extending the season of interest in your in your landscapes. Um, also, as Leland mentioned in the, in the description, most people tend to think of uh, plants in our landscapes as as being valuable and interesting through two seasons: uh, spring and fall. Um, leaf color and, and flower color are the, are the first two things that jump to mind when people think about plants. But what we want to talk about today and, and to get people's brains and thinking about is uh, taking advantage of those small landscapes and, and making those plants earn their keep in the landscape so that they look good winter, spring, summer, and fall. And what I want to talk about are, are some of those cultural characteristics of plants, uh, trees in particular, that will kind of attract your eye through those different types of season.
So changing our horticulture perception of seasonal interest, um, thinking beyond that one season of color um, and, and flavor. This is a, a shot of uh, our crab apple collection here at the research lab. Very, very beautiful in the spring, a good harbinger of spring when you've gone through a, a dark, dismal winter. It's nice to have some, some color that, that jumps into the landscape. But um, think, think beyond that, that first dimension. Think, think long term. And as I mentioned, I, as well as anybody, love the, the colors that come with spring, the, the multitude of flowers. And, and one thing that, that um, I didn't cover in a, in a lot of detail is, is scent. Um, there's something about your senses being awakened by, by something that you can't see, and, and flowers that have a fragrance are a very important component in, in thinking about selecting plants. But, you know, it, it's nice to have, have the spring blooms. But having things that look good winter, spring, summer, fall, that's, that's the ultimate goal in, in, in what you want to do when you select plants. Um, you know, our landscapes get smaller all the time in terms of our home landscapes, in terms of gardens, in terms of public space. And think about plants that will accentuate those, those spaces at, at, at all those different times of year. And, and how do we get to that point? What are, what are the things that we look for when we're selecting, selecting plants? And this is a real basic um, moniker that I've used in, in other lectures and just to kind of stick in people's brains is, is look for the three Bs, uh, and that's berries, barks, and, and buds. And when I speak about berries, I'm talking about the, the fruiting structures of, of plants, both deciduous and, and coniferous plants, that, that fruiting structure, the thing that produces seeds, the thing that produces the, the nuts of the plant, not just what you would traditionally think of as berries. And in, in this picture here, I've got some pictures of two different types of hollies that have different colored berries. But think about uh, fruiting structures. Uh, the picture in the right corner is a pomegranate. The picture in the upper corner is uh, Arizona cypress with those really pretty, very characteristic fruiting structures, the, the juniper berries as we call them. Um, and the picture below that is of a fringe tree. So when I'm talking about, about berries, these are the types of things that I'm, I'm talking about. And they come on at different seasons. Some uh, start to emerge in the spring after the plants flower, and it, and it depends on the bloom time. Um, you would like to have something that's going to extend into different seasons, so, so think about that when you're, you're selecting plants too, um, fruit that may emerge later on into the, into the season and, and come to color in late fall and, and into winter when there isn't as much color in the landscape. You know, we, we rarely think about a plant like a rose in terms of anything other than its flower. Uh, there's a shot of some rose hips that add a lot of dimension to the winter landscape. Um, they also provide a source of, of food for, for animals. But um, that's such a, a bright vision in, in the dead of winter to, to see that nice bright color. Um, other shots of, of fruit, uh, magnolias produce a, a pretty incredible looking fruit that you don't think about that persists into the winter on an evergreen plant. And acorns on oak trees, I think, are, are quite fascinating and, and, and nice to look at. And I, and I like to, to mention, uh, you know, don't just think about the ornamental characteristics of these types of things, but they also provide a lot of educational opportunity. It helps us uh, to have a talking point when we're trying to get people engaged and interested in plants to think about both the ornamental interest of a plant other than uh, leaf and flower, but also it helps explain how these plants function. It helps us to better engage with our, our landscapes and use it as a teaching point. Conifers are a great source of, of the, the, the berries, bark, and buds. These are our fruiting structures. These are the cones. Um, when they mature and harden off, they, they provide a lot of color. But when they first start to emerge, both the, the cone and the flowering structure, add a lot of ornamental interest um, on, a, on a somewhat, what some people can, can consider a plastic plant that's, that's just green. Um, it, it adds another dimension, another texture. It's something to, to look for when you're selecting that, uh, that family of plants. Um, conifers are nice with needles. They provide lots of different texture, different sizes of, of their foliage, but it's nice to have those, those flowering structures that eventually turn into cones. Um, 
Everybody knows about the sweet gum ball. They may not like them from a maintenance standpoint, but I think they had a lot of interest both when they're on the plant and when they fall on the ground. Um, the Samaras are the fruiting structure of a maple. Uh, again, some people don't consider those ornamental. Um, some are very, very brightly colored. There's a lot of Japanese maple cultivars that have um, exceptionally nice fruiting structures. Uh, again, it adds another dimension to that plant, um, both when they're on the plant, when the plant's in leaf, and some of them persist and extend into the wintertime and, and give that plant another dimension, both in terms of visually what you're seeing, but tactically they'll, they'll move in the wind and provide some movement in the landscape, which I, which I think is important. Um, I've got another shot later on of, of some spent flowers. This is a... Um, Cloveteria, a uh, tree with the pink flowers below, uh, a nice late blooming, late summer blooming plant for us, and those uh, seed pods as a result of the flowers will persist in our landscape for, for quite a while, adding a, another, another dimension in, in extending that season of interest uh, in the plant, both ornamentally and, and from an education standpoint. One of the other bees um, that we're all familiar with is, is bark, not the one on the left, but the other two. There are a lot of trees that are, are known for having exceptional bark. Um, the, the left corner is an oak tree, a white oak, uh, really, really nice, interesting bark. Um, and the other one is just a stewardia. And there's lots of plants that have that multicolored uh, stem issue. And, you know, select these types of things from a zonal perspective that will do well in, in your neck of the woods. But, you know, think about that dimension, um, both for a winter landscape when there isn't as much color, there isn't as much going on, but it's, it's something that I look for and that I see um, winter, spring, summer, or fall. It's something that stands out through, through all the season of the landscape. Um, you know, the texture of, of trees is, is nice, that vertical nature, and if you've got a nice warty bark like these two trees, it just increases that dimension. And, um, you know, it, again, look at them ornamentally, but also from an educational standpoint. You know, we can explain the function of a tree and, and what the bark does. And it, it just opens up the, the brain and the, and the eye and, and the thought pattern and, and learning more and experiencing more and, and appreciating trees that are in our landscape so much more. Um, you know, winter gardening is, is important. And... Uh, Bark can also extend to, to twigs and, and stems of a tree. You know, the red twig dogwoods, the colored dogwoods, have a wide zonal range. They can be used in a, in a lot of parts of the country, and uh, they just really add a lot of sizzle and spark to a, a winter landscape, um, you know, especially highlighted by the shot with the snow on it. The shot on the right is just a, one of the striped bark maples, a uh, coral bark maple that's just vibrant. And in a, in a winter landscape, I believe that shot was taken last February. Um, you know, one of my favorite bark characteristics is, is the flaking peeling bark. This is a paper bark maple. And in our neck of the woods, we have a plethora of crepe myrtles. And again, just getting your brain to think about uh, what's that plant going to look like when it reaches maturity. How is it going to add interest to some different times of the year? And, and extend that enjoyment and extend that interaction with, with people in the, in the landscape. And a lot of people don't think about this part of the plant, the, the buds. You know, that's more of a close-up nature, um, depending on the, the tree species, but it's a good ID characteristic, which, again, from an educational standpoint, helps us to understand what plants we have in our landscape, how to identify them, how we can connect with them. Um, and ornamentally, I think they're, they're beautiful and striking through, through the, the spring and uh, from the winter and into the spring. Um, you know, most of them are small. The picture on the right is a big leaf magnolia. That's quite a substantial size bud that you can see from a, from a greater distance um, and just really gives you another, another dimension in the landscape. Um, you know, and, and not just leaf buds, but flower buds. Uh, the plant on the left is an Edgeworthia, a rice paper plant. It's known for these silvery buds. And against the dark green backdrop, uh, close to where people can see it, it really, really stands out and attracts a lot of attention. Um, and Cornus moss, one of the first blooming trees for early, early spring for us in North Carolina and one of my favorite plants. A very characteristic bud. Again, it helps you identify the tree, helps you connect with it. And when they open up for these uh, late season flowers, which are, are oh so nice, early season flowers, um, just a really nice characteristic in the landscape.
and fall color. Um, it's not to be unappreciated. Uh, it's one of my favorite times of the year, and it's a, a characteristic of trees, shrubs, and plants in general that most people understand and have an appreciation for. Um, you know, think about the times of the year when you want this to, to be prevalent. There are trees that will start to turn earlier. A lot of it is temperature and, and environmentally based. But also from a from a design standpoint, and if you're thinking about that, what colors do you want from a fall color perspective? Um, you know, there are the traditional reds, there are the traditional oranges, but there are darker colors. There are, are purples and, and deep burgundies, and and think about these types of things too when you're thinking about plants for your landscape. What what color scheme do you want? Don't limit to your, yourself to to the old standbys. You know, look for plants that are, are known for those those types of fall colors. Um, the shot on the right of a crab apple, you get the advent of the, the, the cool and groovy fruit, but also some, some decent fall color. Um, oaks are known for, for different colors, uh, reds predominantly, but uh, both color ranges go in, in a lot of different directions. I, I like to recommend plants that cover a broad kaleidoscope of, of colors in the, in the color spectrum. They, they go through different stages. They may start, start out yellow and fade to orange, and then fade to a, a darker red, and, and ultimately to almost a, a burgundy or, or a purple color. Um, you know, think about those types of things when, when you're selecting plants. Um, you know, in my personal landscape, I like things to earn their keep and, and provide me lots of interest, and I tend to move towards the things that, that have more than one color when they're going through that spectrum in the, in the fall. Again, uh, crepe myrtles, they're very prevalent for us in the south, and most people just think about their bark color and a late season flower, which are both important characteristics, but they also provide a nice fall color. And uh, there's something to be said for a plant that lays down a nice carpet, so you kind of get uh, – you get a dual effect from the fall color. You get the nice upright on the plant itself, and in, in the last hurrah, those, those leaves are falling to the ground and, and carpet the ground in another sheen of color. It, it, it further ex extends that, uh, that, that wonderful advent. Um, and, and just think about your ranges of colors. There, there's yellows. There's reds. Uh, you know, think about those when you're planning from a design standpoint and, and, and what you want to get out of your landscape. You know, other characteristics, the, the three Bs are, are by no means a, a limiting factor. It's, it's a general guideline, but there's, there's other things to think about. Uh, the, <clears throat> there's variegated foliage. Um, there's textures, both in coniferous plants and uh, hardwood plants. You think about those advents when you're, you're adding a landscape, so you've got a little bit of a, a, a color difference. And I like to remind people that, that green is a color. There's different shades of green to think about, too. Um, you know, don't underestimate that factor in, in selecting a plan, and, and it's good to have that mix of, of dynamics in the landscape. Uh, there's dark foliage plants that, that add a, a bit of a kick into the landscape, and, and think about those types of factors as well. I mentioned texture um, and leaf size. They add a lot of... of uh, elements to a landscape. I'm lucky to live in a part of the world where we can grow a lot of tropical plants, so we can mix those things in to, to give some big, bold foliage. But you can do that with, with other plants from, from a zonal perspective. The, the shot with my hand in it is, a, is an elm tree that's known for this big foliage, and then just some shots of some, some uh, big leaf magnolias that add a lot of texture. And, and people don't really think about those from a, from a, a design land, uh, landscape home landscape, urban landscape standpoint, but they often do well in those types of situations. And I showed a shot earlier, some spent flower blooms. This is a, a hydrangea, obviously not a tree, but there are trees that will hold on to their their spent flower blooms into the into the winter before they upsize in the spring. And I think that's a, a lovely factor to think about in a in a landscape to extend your season of interest. And season of bloom is important. Um, things do bloom in the spring, but what time of the year in the spring, early, mid to late? Think about those when you're selecting plants. When is your audience going to be in that landscape to see that? These are things to think about. Um, late summer is an important time when there isn't a lot of color. And, and right now in North Carolina, we're in the throes of, of late summer. Uh, 
uh, with the heat that we've had lately and, and things look a little bit ragged around the edges and our crepe myrtles are still going strong, which adds some color to this time of the year. I, I love winter blooming things, which hazels are a good plant. Um, and think about how those, those buds are going to extend, like the hydrangea that I showed, um, and like the colerotaria, um, how those are going to last into winter and, and give you that dimension of interest as well. So season of bloom is, is important to think about. Um, forms in the landscape are important. I'm a sucker for fastidia trees. I like things to take up that, that vertical nature. Um, they add a lot of impact into a landscape and, uh, you know, think about those types of things, the ultimate height, width, uh, requirements, culturally for the, for the plant. And winter outline or the bones of the landscape is, is also important. Um, it's nice to have the, the colors of, of bark that you can see in the wintertime. Uh, the nice outline of a conical tree, the, the nice soft weeping texture of a big mature tree. There's the value of that in the landscape is it's hard to put a, a price tag on that, but it just adds so much to that uh, winter landscape or the bones of, of, of your landscape and, and where you place those types of things and how you work with them in your in any type of situation, home, uh, street landscape, urban landscape, parks. What it, it, it's a very important characteristic. Mature trees that have such a, a graceful spot in the landscape and, and thinking about what their texture and form is going to look like, uh, it's, it's important to, when you're selecting these types of things to, to think about those types of processes too. Um, and, and kind of in closing, again, just to briefly recap, uh, fall is nice, spring blooms are nice. I, I love the advent of fall coming in and the bright contrasting colors and, and then the dimensions of that. But, but think beyond that and, and how you can impact uh, the landscape uh, the most importantly from, from a personal standpoint and, and the audience that you're, you're trying to address. And again, um, any, any further information you'd like, uh, there's, there's some information for you, and um, I, I look forward to answering some questions now. Great. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, Rosie, do we want to open the line for questions, please? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your name when prompted. Your name must be recorded in order for your question to be introduced. To withdraw a question, you may press star 2. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment, please. And I also would like to remind folks that you can, if you don't want to call in with your question, you can ask it online at that that Q&A tab at the top of the screen, you can type in your question there to me, and I can read it out. So that's another option as well. While we're waiting, I've got a few couple uh, questions for you, Greg. First off, there was, when you were uh, showing the slide uh, about bark, or one of the slides about bark, there yeah. was a, a tree that had rather a spiky, was this sort of a spiky bark, and I was wondering what kind of tree that was. Um. I think it is a – there's a, a tree called prickly ash, Xanthocercus, I think is the genus, and I, I may be wrong. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, that's what that was. When I was going through my, my slides to put this together, I was, I was looking for that, that particular one, and I couldn't find it in my slides, and I, I took it off of a, a database that we have here at the lab. Gotcha. Um, and I'm pretty sure that that's what that is. Okay, great. Uh, Thinking about uh, how how this would be implemented in the towns and cities where many ACT members and a lot of our listeners are living and working, uh, I know you mentioned that at least for the – I think there was an oak in there that you were talking about, but are all of these diverse and uh, beautiful trees, they all work well in urban settings? I, I tend to lead, lean towards plants. Um, personally and professionally, that are going to hold up well in, in our land, urban landscapes. And when I say that, I mean places that are less than hospitable in terms of soil, in terms of cultural care. Um, I don't have, have time to, to coddle and, and, and baby things in my own landscape, and, and that sounds harsh, but it's just the reality uh, that, that we live in in our, our multitasking world. And, and people want plants that are going to be tough and hold up well. So those are the ones that I, I tend to recommend. You know, I've got some favorites that are a little more fussy and require more care, and I, I think there's room for both of those things in our gardens and in, in urban situations, streetscapes, street landscapes, and, and public areas. But I tend to 
advise people in, in those types of situations to use things that can that are a little bit tougher and able to handle those types of things. And I would say probably 90% of the pictures that I show today and, and things that I talk about in general are going to be along those lines. I, I want people to enjoy plants and, you know, particularly people that are just getting into handling plants and working with plants is, is don't give them some fussy things that are going to take more care and, and, and need more issues to, to keep them green and alive. Um, there will be time for those types of things. But I, I like to recommend things that can, can handle urban situations, and, and those are the, the situations that I work in on a daily basis, um, plants that are going to be in, a, in an area where they're, they're going to interact with people, maybe not in a, a, a positive way in terms of being abused and, and, and not getting watered and cared for on, on, a, on a regular basis. So uh, long answer to your, your very simple question, those are usually pretty tough plants that I like to tell people to use. Okay, that's that. A perfect answer, actually, because um, yeah, some some of them have a uh, sort of delicate structure, or they look really really beautiful, and it's nice to know that they are hardy as well. And that's whenever I get asked, whenever I do tours, lectures that I do, that's that's what I'm pitching to people because the you know that that suits all all requirements. You've got the aesthetic aspect that's nice; they're beautiful. Um, and they're they're tough as nails and, and can and can thrive in, in urban situations, and that's kind of the way the nursery industry is moving towards as well. Great. Are, do we have any questions on the line? Yes, our first question comes from Ms. Wakeham. Yeah, this is Louise Wakeham. Leland, you were asking about that tree with the spiky. Yes. Yeah. Bark. Uh, we have a tree out here that looks a lot like that, which is a bujum tree. Hmm. And they're from, I believe it's South Africa. I know we have some down on uh, in, in both of our the botanic garden here in Phoenix and down on the campus in, in Tucson at the U of A. So that's a, the it, it could, I know exactly the tree you're talking about. We had one in our conservatory at Biltmore, and it was a, a lumpy, warty, not a very fun thing to bump against. Yes. It, it looks it looks very similar to the, yeah. to the, um, to the what they call the toothache tree, the prickly, toothache prickly tree. ash. Mm -hmm. That, that, I just wanted to throw that in. I'm glad you – I was trying to rack my brain and think of – so I could say both of those names because there is there is a chance that it could be that because this came from a, a broad database library that we have here at the lab, and sometimes they, they may not be labeled correctly. But it's I'm pretty sure it's that, that prickly ash. Oh, good. I'm going to have to look that one up. I don't know that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Louise. Do we have other questions on the line? No, sir, not at this time. Okay, great. I was uh, thinking about uh, something that I've uh, seen a lot on calendars for uh, cities and, and nonprofits all across the country recently, a lot of uh, tree tours as uh, sort of a, a, as a community activity to do during the summer. Uh, and it made me think that even though I see most of those during the summer and fall, uh, Winter, as you've just shown, is a great time to look at trees mm -hmm. as well because of all these features that are only visible then. Uh, if you were sort of changing a tour, clear, clearly <laughs> uh, you guys have, I'd imagine, at, at your arboretum tons of uh, beautiful samples and lots of visitors come through. And I guess in, in the winter, what are the things you would like to show off the most? In the winter time, yeah. Um, I, I think that I mean that's one of my favorite times to take people out into the landscape to, to look at plants <clears throat> because it's it's a hard sell. Um, it's it's kind of weather dependent, and you know I'm I'm lucky enough to work in a career where I can spend a great deal of time outside, so I enjoy it. So it's nice to get people outside that time of the year, but it's also a nice time for people to get a better understanding of plants and how they interact with the landscape. You can, you know, it's always, I've always heard it referred to as the bones of the landscape, the structure of a tree, a shrub, um, all those things in, in, in the, in the wintertime, they're almost like skeletons, uh, the deciduous plants I'm speaking of. But it's a, it's a neat factor when you think about how to plant a garden to think about how things are going to look at that time of the year. And it also, I'm a big advocate of getting people interested in plants, and I think that it gets them thinking outside of the spring flowered box that that's the only time that a, a plant is enjoyable. Um, and there's so many things to look about. It helps you understand 
what a tree is. It helps you to identify it in a time of the year when it's hard to identify it, plants, um, buds, the bark, you know, even, even crushing a plant and smelling that bark in, in certain times of the year. But it's one of my favorite times to take people out. And I, I, like, I like showing people acorns, um, fruiting structures on plants that are still prevalent. Um, but, you know, if I had to pick a favorite, I would, I would probably say um, the bark of a tree. Um, there, there's just such interesting textures, um, ridges, forms. Uh, it's just a neat factor. And interesting trees like lace bark elms, uh, you know, lace bark pines, um, sycamores, plane trees, things that have exfoliating bark with different colors. It's just such a neat dimension to, to show people. Great. And I, I, I didn't want to touch too much on it because I believe that's something Edith is going to yeah. address more is sort of how we can use uh, a good select, selecting trees appropriately for, for outreach based on mm -hmm. the seasons. Um, I, you, you mentioned it, and so we're looking forward to hearing a little more about, uh, you know, how to get people excited about trees. One question from the web is, which hazel is good in the Midwest? How large do they get? Um, I think they do fine in the Midwest. I, I, we had a, a decent collection at the Holden Arboretum. Um, in other parts of Ohio, we used them at the zoo in Cincinnati. So I would think that they would do well. Um, depending on the, the species and the cultivars um, and also the, the growing conditions, excuse me, um, you know, average height for a witch hazel, and, and they're usually multi-stem trees, 10 to, to 12 feet, maybe maximum height, but they, they stay kind of low and, and broad spreading. <laughs> Great. I think uh, at this point we're going to switch over to our next presenter. Thanks very much, Greg. Uh, Thank you. Up next is Edith Macra. As the Community Trees Advocate for the Morton Arboretum, Edith has assisted some 270 Chicagoland communities with urban forestry issues from Arbor Day to zoning. MACRA has led the Emerald Ash Borer team to draft a readiness plan and now serves on the Governor's Advisory Panel to coordinate the response in Illinois. She began her career at the top, climbing trees as a certified arborist, and eventually launched Mayor Daly's Green Seats program. Edith, who has a BS in forestry, formerly directed the Massachusetts Urban Forestry Program, and we're lucky to have her here today to talk to us. Well, thank you. It's kind of neat being on uh, one of these as, as a speaker. I've never done that, so uh, kind of neat to talk to a national audience, and I, I just have to say um, that it was a little intimidating uh, talking about seasonal features to a national audience where some of you have um, the ability to grow so much more than we do in the north. So, you know, we do have zone envy, those of us who are limited to uh, to a smaller palette of trees, so we have to try that much harder uh, to make ordinary trees more interesting. We don't have um, the toothache tree with the spikes, and we don't have crepe myrtle and such. So it's kind of been an, an just an interesting uh hobby I've had over the years is to try to find ways to interpret trees uh, for uh, for folks so that we could build a little bit more appreciation and understanding for trees, particularly using seasonal features to do that. So, um, Greg, it was a perfect segue into the, the, the way that I wanted to approach this um, is to that look at, at a couple of uh, ways of, of sort of connecting to, to the landscape. Um, First off, kind of in consideration or in addition to what Greg was talking about with um, the features, the seasonal features, is to think just a little bit about the site uh, that we'd be using um, certain plants in and the scale at which we might want to appreciate them. Um, is it something that, are these features something that we can see um, mostly close up? Greg talked about buds being something that you wanted to uh, experience close up, whereas something like form might be something that we can appreciate uh, at a larger scale. And then I wanted to talk about interpretation of, of these. Um, again, Greg Greg uh, spoke to t the opportunity to teach people, but I'll, I'll just review a few creative ways, perhaps, um, of getting people excited about trees and connecting to them. Um, so the building off that point exactly is if we have something like um, a beach uh, bark, 
uh, beech tree, which is a very interesting tree. And um, what we might notice is that it does look like elephant skin. Um, you can see my friend there on, on the right. But once you sort of communicate that to the public, and there are a lot of ways to do that, is that they start to then notice it too. We might see all these beautiful features in the landscape, and we have um, uh, nearly a million visitors here at the Arboretum, and we find that most of them don't really pay attention to our trees, oddly enough. They come here for lots of uh, different reasons, um, and we'll pass by some of the beautiful features in the landscape. So it's kind of our challenge uh, collectively as staff here to connect people to, uh, to these interesting features. So um, pointing them out, and appreciating what you can point out in terms of, of scale and, and site. Um, when we have ordinary street trees, it tends to be something that uh, we're looking for for the very toughest trees um, and that we're, we might be looking harder uh, to get people to focus on um, particular features, which is where we want to go to something, say on street trees or larger landscapes, is that we're going to go for something that's a little bit bolder. And among the features that I'd say would be the boldest, we do spend six months of our year in the in the winter here, uh, would be, as Greg pointed out, bark is a good one, but form is a very powerful one. Form, structure, branching habit is a very powerful feature that we have to think about, again, spending half of our year here without leaves. And that's the kind of thing that we I think we can incorporate into um, most of the community projects that we'd be doing, particularly um, something like a formal LA if we have that opportunity, or in the case of some urban greening projects that I've been involved in, when you're faced with a big you know, blank brick wall um, or concrete wall, that does in some ways provide a backdrop or a frame for some trees, particularly with uh, interesting feature or bark when you, can, when you can use that. So I'd say form is pro form structure probably the boldest of the features that you can use in most landscapes and um, with little interpretation, uh, you know, get people to appreciate snow is a, is a nice feature that we use here uh, to highlight trees whenever we can, particularly kind of building off our, uh, our, our gray winters that we have. The next boldest feature that I'd say would be um, fall color, which uh, we always say that sells itself. Fall, fall is our busiest time of year here at the Arboretum, and uh, even in the Midwest where we don't have as many of the screaming colors, um, with native trees, it is the one time of year that we really don't have uh, trouble getting people to look up. Uh, it is another feature that you can appreciate at a very large scale, as well as some of the subtleties of um, fall fruiting colors, the, the combination between um, bright fruits and bright foliage that Greg showed us is something that can be appreciated a little bit uh, more closely, um, but certainly this is one that we can appreciate. As I'd like to say, larger scale would give us 55 miles an hour um, in the winter time or sometimes even at night as these are the kinds of uh, features you can appreciate. Um, and we, anybody who's involved in, in tourism at all will, will always run into when is the best time of year to, uh, to visit the, the, you know, the, the fall color. Is this the, is, are they at their peak? We'll get phone calls that will say, you know, after a big winter or rain, well, are the leaves all gone? No, and Greg pointed this out, too, is they're not all gone, is they, they're on the ground. But um, those can be appreciated both with, um, uh, you know, on the trees once they fall, until you get some heavy winds, you still have. In the case of a landscape like an arboretum here, we have these large circles or skirts that I would call them with um, the, the leaves uh around the trees, and that just makes for a beautiful little little uh, landscape feature that you can also enhance with uh, when you have topography. Um, that can be really stunning. A uh, bark is another bold feature that can be appreciated um, to some degree at a distance, but is the kind of thing that you would experience intimately as well, especially with some of the um, the te more textural ones that might be enjoyed by touching. A uh, fruit is something that's kind of median in terms of its scale that you can use it at. Uh, on the lower left, we have a, a winter king hawthorn, and that's something that will give a real scream of color um, that most people will appreciate, whereas some of the other more interesting fruits would need to be interpreted or pointed out um, to, to folks. Um, my assistant was a tram driver here at the Arboretum and would often um, point out the fruits, again, that most of the time the public isn't paying attention to, but once you draw it to their attention, um, what those uh, seeds are, and in the case of the one on the upper right, uh, those are Kentucky coffee tree um, pods. And there's an interesting story to be told in just what those pods are, and much like with the elephant bark, um, is that people have something that they can connect to. Kentucky coffee tree was used as a, as a coffee substitute, or uh, lower right is uh, black walnuts, which urban people forget that, that walnuts do grow locally, and that's something that, again, will, they'll maybe 
soften their opinion of, they tend not to be very popular tree because of those those large nuts. But it's edible. It's important source of wildlife. Um, makes good ice cream. So it's something people can remember. Um, flowers on on uh, mass are certainly something that can be appreciated at large scale. And Greg showed us a crab apple landscape. Uh, that's something that is just breathtaking. We have a community here uh, in the Chicagoland area that's known as Lilac uh, Village, and their motto, their logo. Um, are lilacs, and that's something that in mass kind of turns the whole town purple, and they revel in it. They have a, a lilac queen and a lilac parade, and they really have a good time uh, with it. Um, other flowers that uh, might be experienced a little bit more intimately can be very interesting and, again, give us an opportunity for uh, folks to get engaged with the landscape. Um, the upper right there, the yellow flowering one, is one of our earliest flowering trees. It's cornus moss or cornelian cherry dogwood, um, whereas the lower picture there, the beautiful pink, is the more recognizable dogwood that you folks grow down south. We don't have access to that, but uh, we take advantage of the fact that the very earliest and the very latest color extends our season, and that's something that uh, people will look for, too. Um, and likewise, with the petals on the ground uh, is, is a feature that can be pointed out. The carpeting we tend to, as urban foresters, um, battle the old uh, uh, prejudice that people have against petals on the ground as being a hazard or on the sidewalks. Catalpa was a tree here that uh, I enjoy. It's a beautiful tree. The flowers are huge, um, but we'll litter the sidewalks, and um, residents would complain that the, you know, the trees were messy. Uh, but in the kinds of landscapes where that's acceptable, um, that can be pointed out as, as an additional feature. And as Greg pointed out, buds, um, something that would be experienced, again, at a, at a more intimate scale, the kind of things that you can do, and I'll talk about some of these interpretive ideas at the end, but this is the kind of thing you can interpret as you're leading people on tree walks or through through some of the, the gimmicks related to promotion that I'll close with here. Um, and we've done this uh, both intimate experiences such as uh, tree walks um, or docent-led walks that we have here at the Arboretum, but through our outreach and publicity is let people know that they can experience the, the trees. One of our sort of quirky, popular, um, promotions, and I mean promotion m might have been a line in a press release related to the Katsura tree, which is an exotic tree, but when you crunch it, the leaves in the fall time, uh, step on the leaves, they smell like cotton candy, and that's the kind of thing that is really sort of captured um, in terms of public outreach, a little bit of the imagination is as much as we're going to get people interested in the features of trees. That's a neat angle on that when we can, when we can use that, and as Greg mentioned, fragrance is something um, that I like to say can sometimes be stealthy. We have the large flowering shade trees like a Kentucky coffee tree, which has a very inconspicuous little green flower um, but smells marvelous, and it's the kind of thing that you might notice um, walking through it uh, but not necessarily see the flowers. Linden is another one that's going to be very fragrant, and I think it's our challenge as uh, tree advocates is to help um, people appreciate that, interpret the, the flowers, even if they don't see them. Um, and, of course, take advantage of anything tactile. Um, it, we have a sumac branch in the uh, upper left there that's uh, very fuzzy. Staghorn sumac is, is its name, and that's the kind of thing that, that kids and adults could um, get a chance to experience. Taste whenever you can you can do that safely, and uh, it's a wonderful way for people to get to know trees. And amelanchier or serviceberry is a very popular tree around here. It's become quite a staple in urban landscapes, and very few people know that that's edible um, and quite tasty. So something that we like to promote as a as a very beautiful four season plant, um, and the the third season, the summertime, would be the, the edible fruits. Um, one gimmicky thing that I just wanted to point out in, in using all of the features of a, of a tree, when I was an urban forestry coordinator in, in Massachusetts, I had a few grants that I made um, that were so novel to the point of really kind of sticking with me over the years. And um, I made a grant to a firehouse. It was a municipal firehouse for tree planting uh, and landscaping project in which they, they focused around the fire theme and used all aspects of the plants. Uh, this is an, uh, an autumn blaze maple, uh, known for the fall color, but it had the, the blaze portion there. There was the fire thorn, or pyracantha, which is the middle, um, and then smoke bush. So everything related to fire and smoke 
Uh, and I thought it was a really neat way to get people engaged in the landscape looking a little bit more closely at it. I had a similar project with a needs assistance uh, training center for dogs, um, assistance dogs for people with disabilities, and they used the dogwood tree and bone fat, which is a, a native plant here, a native forb, um, all on the theme. And I think that's one way, another way that we can, can use more of these uh, subtle seasonal features of, of trees. Um, and then I wanted to just talk about one particular case of the catkins um, story that I was just very impressed with. We work with a, a very talented public relations staff here, and um, Gina Tedesco, who I'll give you the links for some of the work that she had, had done, is comes to us not from a tree background. So she's constantly taking the things that we tree geeks, uh, as we like to call ourselves here, talk about, um, and she'll find some interesting way to make that appealing. And early in March, we have daffodils that bloom here, uh, a little bit of the Cornelian cherry dog with that yellow blooming tree that I showed, and not much else. And Gina heard us talking about what's going on out there, wanting to draw people here for a particular warm spell that we had, and she got us talking about catkins. Um, and it's something that Greg would point out, very interesting flowers. We know they're interesting. And getting people to look at them is a bit of a challenge. Uh, she put out a press release, which I'll, I have the link on the, the next slide there, and it was the flowers um, nobody knows is what she called them. And she found, she did a lot of research on catkins, and we have a very famous uh, naturalist here, um, May Watt at the Arboretum, who used the phrase, uh, catkins are often, quote, born to blush unseen. Uh, and she used this in the press release, put out a list of all the trees that would be putting out um, catkins, and invited people to the Arboretum to come see them. And as far as any press release would get attention for a tree part, um, I call this one wildly successful. And in preparation for this talk, I asked her, Gina, how do you find an angle on these kinds of things with plants um, that, that's going to capture the public? And she said, again, we tree people talk too much about it, but she said, um, and I'm using this quote because I thought it was hilarious, um, the informed, that would be, be us tree professionals, the informed should become further informed by the uninformed. So in other words, stand back and kind of get a fresh perspective about what we know and love about trees, again, particularly subtle things. Um, over the seasons and try to look at them anew and using whatever we can to try to communicate that um, and our, our creative um, angle on, on this kind of, uh, these kinds of interesting features about trees. And there on the next slide are the, the links, some of the press releases she wrote, as well as uh, you can get some of the language that she used um, and the timing for when these press releases were put out there. And then finally, in closing, I wanted to, to to, to say we can bring the, can't necessarily get folks here to get out and look at catkins, um, but any opportunity you have to show off these really lovely features of, of trees, um, do that. And we have a group here at the Arboretum called the Botanical Arrangers, and these are a group of volunteers that walk on the grounds every week and find things in bloom um, they have to derive from the Arboretum grounds somewhere. Sometimes they're using uh, traditional flowers that might be more um, visible to the general public, but they're often digging deep into our collections to find tree blossoms and tree features throughout the year that are going to capture people's attention. And this uh, this is something that I've used in my career in tree advocacy over the, over the years and found it to be a really neat opportunity to engage people. These particular arrangements that are up on the slides right now, um, we use throughout the Arboretum at our reception desk and our front desk where people, uh, where visitors, we're entertaining visitors, and folks will always stop and ask questions about the, the blooming plants in there. In the middle of one particularly, you can see it's smokebush, um, autumn clematis, and some fall uh, foliage that's the, the purple variety, uh, some cones and things. This would get people to look closely at a plant. The, the arrangements are always interpreted, so there'd be a little uh, key to what these plant species are, and people will always ask about them, sometimes go out on the grounds and look for them. And I would carry that one step further. Having, uh, I had the, the pleasure of being an intern here in college, uh, which was many years ago, um, and our landscape architect started this trend of, of making these arrangements from what was blooming on the grounds, and I took a uh, floral design course in college and always kept that in the back of my head is that tree blossoms and tree fruits can be very interesting and I've started making corsages um, 
for events when I've had an award ceremony or something from whatever's blooming that started with the Tree City USA awards program I used to do. And likewise, rather than purchase flowers or get flowers donated, I will go out um, and pick what might be in bloom. And even if you don't have an arrangement, knack, or talent, um, pick some interesting branches and find an interesting container um, and use them at the public uh, events that you have to further engage people in looking a little bit more closely um, at the seasonal features of trees. And that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to make points about in, in um, terms of uh, seasonal interest. So thank you for that opportunity, and I'd be, be happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you so much, Edith. Uh, Rosie, can we open the line for questions? Yes. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your name when prompted. And I'll remind folks that you can also type in your questions uh, online by clicking on that Q&A tab at the top. As people are uh, coming up with their questions, I've got a few for you, Edith. One of them was that uh, I think when, when we spoke last, you had this uh, great comment that you made about uh, selecting species uh, to complement sort of seasonal usage of the site. Yes. Thank you. That is, that is one uh, point I, I forgot. So thank you for that reminder there. Uh, it's something I think uh, people will like to hear about. Sure, and that was uh, related to kind of scale um, issues. Is, is to think about your your seasonal feature and when the site might be most popular. Um, I know when I was doing uh, community tree plantings, schools are you know were often a focal point, um, and that might be something that we do for Arbor Day. Um, that might not be the best place to put a tree whose strongest feature is going to be summer blooms. That would be the kind of thing when when school kids are gone, um, you might not want to waste your main feature um, on uh, summer flowering trees that are going to be subtle and beautiful. That might be something, say, think of college campuses, um, especially on the East Coast that are renowned for fall color. Well, that's when kids are coming back to school, and I think the landscape can be uh, very inspiring. Um, as far as, a strong winter features, and we do programming here at the Arboretum of all sorts, summer concerts, and we have a uh, uh, our winter events, and anything taking place off-season, we have the luxury of uh, putting those events in the Pinetum, which is always green and, and you know, really calls for interpretation in the winter season. But think about your strongest feature. If the landscape is going to be busiest in the winter time, that might be where you want to concentrate some of those really bold features like uh, winter fruits or form um, or uh, bark would be some of those, those strong winter ones. And likewise for summer concert grounds or a farmer's market. If you have the opportunity to plant a, a park that might be used for a farmer's market, that might be a neat place to start to think about also planting uh, trees that have fruits or edible fruits because that's when people will be there and that's what they're thinking about. So one other opportunity to try to really match the features of a tree to, to the site use. Great, thanks. And uh, I guess another thing you brought up that, uh, as you mentioned, lots of folks deal with is uh, sort of the after effect of some of these beautiful features as, as when leaves or petals fall to the ground. Right. Uh, and, and people think they're making a mess. <laughs> uh, how, how have you been able to sort of combat that or use the have you have been able to enhance the beautiful aspects to help reduce people's uh, resistance to trees? Well, Greg kind of talked about this too, is choosing carefully for, for hardiness and um, really knowing the plant you're getting into, and that's something that you're going to need to look for local uh, resources on. But um, if you want to turn people against, uh, you know, a tree, I guess be a little overly aggressive in terms of ignoring that fruit flower concern, um, that usually backfires, and I think that's what happened to some of the trees that I, that I mentioned, like Catalpa, which is um, in many ways such a perfect urban tree for our environment. It's just got it's got the great central leader, and and it's really hardy and durable. Um, but the flower problem, uh, you know, kind of actually caused it to get on the pro prohibited list for some communities. A couple things have happened. One is that we've had a pushback on so many trees that we're now losing urban trees. Uh, our palette is getting smaller and smaller uh, with losses due to invasive species and overplanting of other things. So those kinds of things are slowly coming back on um, lists and are more popular, and people are just asked to, to, to deal with those, those problems. Or um, better yet is to try to use the plants with large fruit or flowers that are a little bit more objectionable, objectionable on uh, 
parkways or planting strips that would be wider in park landscapes or uh, to encourage them for like new subdivision developments in the front yards where you don't have a conflict with a sidewalk. There's not a conflict with a uh, lawn, it would be a conflict with a sidewalk. Um, so the, the other thing is where you can find persistent fruit uh, for crab apples. And crab apples, we've so many residents and, and uh, uh, Homeowners they have terrible experiences with a crab apple where the fruit falls off um, and creates a huge mess in season. Well, there are more than 400 varieties of crab apples that we can grow around here, and we recommend the ones with persistent fruit, um, those where the fruit falls off in the in the winter time or is a dry fruit. So you run into a little bit of a challenge there in wanting to have those really some of those splashy uh, fruits and having also the conflict with the, the, the fruit falling inappropriately, but there are many, many, many choices of interesting fruits and features um, that are not going to be um, so messy because they either fall off in the wintertime, dry up on the plant, um, or dry to begin with and interesting. Um, so just choose carefully and, and opt for the, you know, the right plants in the right place, bottom line. Right, which transitions well into uh, <laughs> our, our, the next session in this four-part series of species selection, which is Right tree, right place. Oh, that'll be uh, later in the month. Rosie, do we have any questions on on queue? No, sir, not at this time. All right. Well, because we're right at the top of the hour, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks so much, Edith and Greg, for great presentations today. And if, if folks do come up with more questions, I'm sure that either of them would be happy to respond to you. You can also send them in to me, and I will get answers back for you. Also, either those um, documents that you uh, posted up the links to will post on the website session for, for this session. So people will, will be able to link to those as well and take a look at that. The presentations and uh, recorded session, as well as a related resource list, will be available in about one week. And we will email everyone who completes uh, this brief survey right here. Uh, the link to those things. So I hope everyone will take just two minutes right now to fill out this survey. It really helps us with our programming uh, so that we can get uh, you webcasts about things you'd like to learn about. Our next webcast session, as I mentioned, is Species Selection Part 3, Right Tree, Right Place, and that'll be in two Thursdays on August 19th. Again, take this survey for us. We appreciate it. And I want to say a big thank you to our presenters, Greg and Edith. Uh, thanks for taking the time today and for, for giving us two excellent presentations. And to everyone who participated and to our sponsors, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining today's conference call. You may disconnect at this time. <laughs>